We are joined by the Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs, Scott Hargreaves. Scott, welcome to Spectator TV. Thanks so much for having me. Scott, every week I receive these emails from the IPA and I recommend viewers go and sign up. They're a conservative, libertarian think tank that does great work when it comes to balancing politics in this country. But those emails provide updates on the state of chaos, also known as Australian politics. Now, this time you wrote about the battle for free speech that is going on between Twitter CEO Elon Musk and Australia's Office of the E-Safety Commission, which we are jokingly referring to as the E-Stasi. Now, I'll admit that I was worried about the backbone of the legal system in Australia. It does have a habit of being a little bit woke. But you say that free speech has had a victory. Was the ruling against the E-Safety Commission on May 14 significant? Oh, it was a very significant uh, victory because... Uh, what we've seen, the e-safety commissioner, and um, uh, who has also been referred to, I believe, as the e-Karen, but not by the IPA because we're a research organisation with over 9,000 members, as you mentioned. Anyone who wants to join can go to our website, see our research and join. But to return to the issue at hand, so the e-safety commissioner, Julie Inman Grant, uh, took Elon Musk to the federal court and not only wanted him to uh, take, de uh, take down the video so it could, of the uh, stabbing in Sydney of the bishop, uh, that was a very public event that everyone knows about, not only wanted it taken down so that Australians couldn't see it, but in fact so that nobody in the world could see it. Uh, Ms. Ms Inman Grant wanted the, uh, the extraterritorial powers, the global reach uh, for the e-safety commissioner. Yeah, well, that is quite an extraordinary thing for an e-safety commissioner to want to have uh, sensorial powers of the whole world. And, of course, one of the questions that was asked is, if our e-safety commissioner can want that sort of power, what happens when other e-safety commissioners in places like China or South America or even Europe want to start taking down Australian content? Is that going to be OK? Has it sort of... How has the IPA's research looked at this? Do we need to have some kind of assurances that other leaders can't take down content from us? And is that part of the conversation about why our e-safety commissioner's decision was so bizarre? Uh, that, that was a point that came out in the judgment, and, and certainly from the IPA's point of view, that's why we will stand for free speech, because uh, in the West... Uh, which has the most uh, developed sense of free speech. It goes right back to the ancient Greeks, to the Romans, uh, through the English Civil War, two and a half thousand years of developing these notions of free speech. If the notion of free speech dies in Australia, if it dies in the West, then it has died around the world. So the idea that we would restrict it in such a way that you no longer have access to information, that a bureaucrat can tell you what you can and can't access uh, the opinions that you can and can't uh, hear because they're deemed to be misinformation or disinformation. If censorship's allowed to reign uh, in Australia, uh, then that, that definitely spreads over the world. And that is, in fact, what the federal court judge said. He said, how could this possibly work? If you allow a single national government to ban something all over the world, there will be other governments... Uh, not as democratic as that in Australia, which will take advantage of that. They must, there might be all kinds of things that they want us to take down. Well, you mentioned the federal court ruling, and I, I'll quote from them here because I thought this was an interesting thing. You said there is widespread alarm at the prospect of a decision by an official of a national government restricting access to controversial material on the internet by people all over the world. It has been said that if such capacity existed, it may be used by a variety of regimes for a variety of purposes not all of which would be benign. Now, that was from the ruling. Now, should any government be able to censor the global conversation? We talk about this. It's important to remember that we used to have a public forum, which was free, and now people don't talk to each other in person, they talk to each other online, and that is a new public forum. But trying to work out what the rules and limitations of this public forum is, is causing a lot of friction in various countries. We're even starting to ask the question of why do we have an e-safety commission and do we need an e-safety commission considering that we did not have one before? So, you know, these things are always sold to us as being for the protection of children. We have the same thing in the UK where their equivalent e-safety was about protecting kids. Uh, do you think that managing the internet really is about child safety or are we sort of using the idea of child safety to implement a much wider and broader type of censorship over public speech? 
Well, we can only uh, report what we see. And when the children... Uh, originally, uh, Ms Inman Grant was appointed as the Children's eSafety Commissioner, uh, and that was the basis on which the, uh, the Parliament and I, I believe the Turnbull government uh, appointed her to say children are our concern. But the next thing we know, we have a campaigner uh, for new censorship laws who believes that uh, the biggest problems facing the West are those of disinformation and misinformation, who goes to Davos to make speeches about it, who sits with a European Union working groups on digital regulation and the last time I looked, the Australia is not actually a member of the European Union, so I'm still trying to figure out how that happens. And, uh, and lo and behold, uh, the first thing is the uh, uh, word child or children's uh, disappeared from the title. So it's now just the eSafety Commissioner. And indeed, it has migrated from issues of harm, which is the uh, notional reason for asking or uh, demanding that the video of the bishop being attacked is taken down, uh, but it's being deliberately confused with the justifications for removing misinformation and disinformation from the internet. Indeed, uh, no less a person than the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, uh, did that in his remarks where he said that this was evidence of how much misinformation there was on the internet. Uh, he was also concerned at some uh, rather scurrilous caricatures and uh, jokes about him that were appearing on the internet. But this is what's happening as there is a, a mission creep, a, uh, a bid for more and more powers over... And it's to, if it was just about uh, protecting the children, we would not have this uh, ceaseless clamour for new laws and even stronger powers and extraterritorial extra reach. Well, you said that about Albanese not liking memes, but I went back through the Labor Party's official Twitter feed and they were making memes of Albanese stitching his head onto Star Wars costumes. So, you know, he can't say he doesn't like memes and then put out memes <laughs> himself. But you say, oh, we're not part of the so European it's, um, Union. Misinformation. Exactly. But you say we're not part of the European Union, but we are in Eurovision, so that we did kind of sneak in there. But you talked about child safety. Now, on this idea, Labor's got another big idea, and that is to place age restrictions on, restrictions on social media. Now, this horrifies me on principle, uh, because like I grew up on social media, and it was a good thing for me, not a bad thing. It depends where you are. And I also believe it's a parenting issue, not a government issue. Uh, but the first question I have is, how is the government going to verify everybody's ages? And my concern, I don't know if anyone's even looked at this, is that digital ID will be used in order to work out how old you are to access social media in order to keep it in line with a government trial protection strategy. Are there any concerns that you have about this? Or so far, uh, do you think it's a good idea? Uh, I, th I think you've described the, uh, how that debate would run. So you start with a relatively benign idea. So we have harm to children. Uh, OK, that's unequivocally bad. Uh, we then start through a series of steps to say, well, that harm is due to social media. So we've instantly taken the uh, focus away from the actual individuals who are at the other end of the key, who are on the keyboard, who are at the other end of this. Um, who are actually doing the harm, but we blame it on the social media platforms. And then we say, well, age restrictions are the answer. And uh, w we in our research, uh, we are deeply concerned because all of the proposals do come back to the notion of uh, then age verification. And that sounds, again, simple enough. And somebody would say, well, well, sure, well, OK, you've got to be 18 to see certain kinds of conduct. But how else could you... Um, prove that you are 18 in an online environment other than through some kind of digital ID system. And if access to the internet becomes linked to a digital ID, uh, then you're part of a, a government system, uh, potentially tracking everything that you're doing, or should I say that the tracking of everything that you're doing becomes a lot easier uh, and more straightforward. Um, and then your notions of privacy have gone out the window. Obviously, censorship uh, becomes much, much easier. So that is, that is just one part of the picture. And again, um, from this notion, very small notion of preventing harm, which is where all this started, which is where most people would think, oh, yes, that sounds like a good thing, uh, we suddenly find ourselves in this, you know, Orwellian web of restrictions on our freedoms, on our freedom of speech and um, the destruction of our rights to privacy.
Well, it's actually a, it's quite sinister, really, when you think about it, because digital ID is a political conversation. It's a topic where people are arguing for and against it. But if they start making digital ID a requirement of engaging in the public forum where these discussions happen, it means that those who are political dissidents must subscribe to something that they reject in principle in order to engage in a conversation to combat the government theory. Now, that is uh, that's more than just an age restriction for kids. That is a political idea and a very expedient way to sign up vast portions of a reluctant Australian populace. Uh, I think this is going to be a conversation people return to quite rapidly. But there's an enormous amount of harmful and hurtful and slanderous and dangerous comments online. I'm sure you get it, I get it. But the e-safety commissioner shows very little interest in things that harm conservatives or libertarians or pretty much anything except a very narrow uh, range of political ideas. So my question is, if the e-safety commission is political in its censorship, is it more dangerous to have it or to get rid of it? Uh, it's, it's definitely more dangerous to have it. I mean, even... even uh I would argue that even if uh, Ms Inman Grant was beyond reproach, even if there was a, uh, an independent panel of, of uh, people who uh, could be trusted due to their wisdom, due to their, uh, the fact that they represent the, uh, the broad views of the Australian people, even if they were sitting in judgment, uh, we still could not uh, trust such an institution. We have to come down on the side of free speech. And we come back to the, the fact that this is what's at stake. To, um, uh, to be able to express your views freely is just a fundamental human right. Um, and then as a society to make the many judgments and decisions about uh, how we are to live, the laws by which we are governed, where governments should spend money, what, uh, who should be in prison and who should not be. The way we've settled this uh, in our democratic system is to be able to put those views forward and uh, let truth and falsehood grapple uh, and enable the truth to become the victor. Not to eliminate preemptively the uh, opinions we don't like, but to allow them to battle in the public square. And let's face it, the uh, internet or social media platforms, they are the new public square. Uh, people rely less and less on mainstream media, they feel remote from their politicians, they have less and less trust in the official political process. All we have is social media and we know of course too that uh, a lot of this has been prompted because Elon Musk took over Twitter and broke the monopoly of the, uh, the left-wing Silicon Valley wokerati that were controlling the social media platforms. And that is one of the reasons why we are now seeing this massive, massive push uh, to regulate the internet because they don't want people like Elon Musk actually allowing all kinds of views to be heard because that's what he's doing at the moment. You're so right, Scott. He, he literally, Elon Musk walked in there carrying the kitchen sink, if I remember correctly, and then he ruffled all <laughs> the feathers of Silicon Valley and everyone went crazy because a real, true free speech platform is a danger to bad political ideas and there are certainly a lot of bad political ideas out there at the moment. But look, of course, your think tank at the IPA, they do wonderful work. They provide all the facts and figures about some of these dodgy ideas so that you can get a better look at them. So I encourage everyone to go and have a look and to subscribe. But thank you for joining us here to Spectator TV. It was an absolute pleasure. Mine too.